Hello and welcome to topic four, lecture one. And in this lecture, we're gonna be learning about understanding crime and victimization. I'm sure that most of you are aware of the heinous serial killing crimes that Jeffrey Dahmer's engaged in in the 1980s and 90s. He's a famous American serial killer, killer and sex offender uh, and he killed and dismembered 17 um, boys and young men in that time period. And his um, activities, his murderous activities were obviously brought to light in the recent Netflix series, Dahmer, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. So why am we talking about Jeffrey Dahmer? Well, um, you know, it's a good way to uh, begin our conversation and our um, exploration of why people commit crimes. And so why did Jeffrey Dahmer do what he did? Um, why was he a serial killer? Why did he dismember and do sort of like scientific experiments on the bodies of, her, of the people that he murdered? Um, why did he engage in cannibalism? Why did he do what he did? Um, was he mentally ill? Well, I mean, yes, he was actually diagnosed as having borderline personality disorder, uh, schizophrenic personality disorder, and, and a psychotic di disorder. However, he wasn't considered to be uh, insane. He was um, sane enough to, you know, uh, stand trial. And in fact, he led, a, a, you know, besides the serial killing, you know, he led a normal life. He had jobs, uh, he was able to hold down jobs, etc. cetera. Um, so was it because he was mentally ill that he did these things? Uh, did he have some sort of neurological disorder? Um, he was known to have fits of outrage. Uh, we know that people who have been exposed to certain kind of either neurochemicals or toxins have problems with their neurotransmitters that can influence their, you know, their inability to control their impulses. Uh, did he have some sort of ne neurological disorder? Uh, was what he did rational? Did he engage in a cost-benefit analysis and he thought the costs associated with what he did, getting caught uh, and, and killing people, uh, maybe the, the benefit that he got, uh, satisfying this need to desire, uh, this desire to kill, the satisfaction of dominating others, uh, maybe what he did was rational. Maybe he was socially disconnected. I mean, when you look at his childhood, he seemed to have a pretty strange childhood. Maybe what was going on with Jeff, Jeffrey Dahmer's was genetic. Uh, after Jeffrey Dahmer's was convicted and sentenced to uh, 16 life in uh, terms of imprisonment, um, his uh, father, Lionel Dahmer, wrote a book. And in the book, he confessed to having similar sort of desires uh, that his son had, even though he never acted upon them. So um, how do we explain the criminal behavior like Jeffrey Dahmer's or really any other person who engages in crime? Now, in the chapter this week, you're going to be learning about different theories of criminal behavior. You'll be learning about the rational choice theory, the trait theory, the psychological theory, the sociological theory, the critical theory, and the developmental theory. Um, in this lecture, we're going to be learning about the rational choice and trait theory. And in the second lecture, we're going to take a look at the sociological theory. Um, you are responsible for reading the, about the other theories in the textbook on your own. If you have any questions about them, come to office hours or drop me an email and we can go into a, a further explanation of those. Another thing I want you to keep in mind is I want you to keep in mind the six criminal justice um, perspectives that we learned about in, uh, uh, last week or a few weeks ago. Uh, and so, because you're gonna see that there is overlap between these theories of criminal behavior and the, um, the, the criminal justice perspectives we've learned about. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. One prominent view of criminality is that people choose to commit crimes. Um, the, the thinking here is that criminals, like most people, are rational and that they engage in a cost-benefit analysis. Now, this might sound very familiar to you because this, um, this dovetails uh, really nicely with the crime control perspective that we learned about a couple of weeks ago, right? I mean, remember from the crime control perspective that James Q. Wilson said, look, um, you know, most of us are just sitting around waiting to see how our society responds to crime. And if it doesn't respond to crime seriously, uh, then we will, you know, engage in crime. But if we feel like we're going to get caught, we feel like we're going to be severely uh, punished for 
engaging in that crime, the cost clearly out can outweigh the benefits. And so choice theory sort of dovetails into that. They say that, look, look, most criminals are like people uh, that when they're deciding or, or, or that criminals like most people are rational when they're deciding to engage in a crime, they just do a cost benefit an analysis. And that if the perceived costs are more than the perceived benefits, then an individual won't engage in criminal activity. However, if the perceived benefits are greater than the perceived costs, then they will engage in that criminal activity. Okay, so if crime is a rational act, in which of these two scenarios is crime more likely to take place? And to help me with that, I brought in my husband, Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Margaret. You having a good day? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, so, he, and he's gonna, um, he's gonna act like the criminal, okay? And so he's gonna look at these two scenarios, and then he's going to, based on his rational action, he's gonna tell us which of the two scenarios is he most likely to burglarize. Okay, so Mike, scenario one, it's 1 p.m. in the afternoon. It's a large, well-constructed home in an expensive neighborhood. There are no bushes in the front yard, okay? Sure. So kind of easy access, but, you know, you can't really hide either because there aren't going to be bushes to, you know, uh, prevent people from seeing you. Right. And there's a big, vicious barking dog in the front window, and the lights are on. Okay, so, hey, maybe people are home. And scenario two, it's in the evening. It's 10 p.m. in the evening. It's a smaller home in a, a much less affluent neighborhood. And there's uh, bushes and a fence, so you might, you know, ev evade detection because of the bushes, but there is a fence that you might have to jump over. But there's also an alley at the back of the house, and so you can get out of there pretty quickly. Um, the lights are off, no dog, okay? Okay. All right, so based on those two scenarios, scenario one, scenario two, which of those two houses are you most likely to burglarize? Well, you know, I don't know that this the setup matters a lot to me. I guess I think that I'm more likely to burglarize the the home in the expensive neighborhood because I would think that there's more expensive goods to steal. Um, okay. Now, obviously, I could be wrong about that. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I am worried about the dog, I guess, a little bit with that first scenario. You know, we have a lot of dogs ourselves, and they can be pretty irritating. Right, they can. Fortunately, though, you know, I do have my Second Amendment rights that would allow me to take care of a vicious dog. Okay. So I guess right. I'm not so worried about that. All right. So you're going to go with scenario one because that while there are some costs associated with it, right, a dog, but maybe you can defend yourself from the dog with your giant gun and that, um, you know, it is, you know, lights on, they might be home. Um, it is the afternoon, so it's likely that they're not home. But what's really motivating your behavior is the benefits, right? What you're going to get from engaging this in this is a lot. You could come away with a lot. Why not scenario two? Like, why, why, are you, why rationally does it not make sense to do scenario two? for you well again i think just the benefit and again i could be wrong about that right obviously people can have nice things in in any kind of neighborhood sure so, uh um are they more likely to be home in scenario two do you think 10 p.m in the evening no lights on i don't know i would say 10 p.m is still pretty early i mean i know people do go to bed early before 10 but 10 p.m still seems like it's pretty early to to go to bed and if there's no lights on and no dog that would sure. mean to me that maybe you could get into the house easier, um, particularly because you have the bushes to hide behind and you do have the access to the alley. All right. Um, but because the cost is, is uh, because the benefit in scenario one is the best, you're going to go for that. That's where you're going to burglarize that house. But again, an unknown benefit, right? So again, that's my reasoning, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Right. That's what I would say. Well, I guess you're going to have to burglarize the home and find out what happens. Right. right. I guess so. Well, thanks for playing along, sweetie. I appreciate it. Okay. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> so as we saw in that previous slide, that when it comes to engaging in crimes, that oftentimes the actions are evaluated on the information, right? Evaluated on, hey, I'm thinking about burglarizing the home. There's two to, two to choose from. Which should I go for? And so, you know, uh, some of the information that might be evaluated when doing a cost benefit analysis is how frequently is this crime detected? You know, there's a part of me that doesn't like to, you know, teach about the criminal justice funnel that we did on, you know, the very beginning of the semester, because it just like basically tells people just how infrequently 
crimes are cleared, right? Um, knowing that, you know, then you might say, hmm, if I'm a rational actor, I might engage in burglary because burglaries are a lot less likely to be detected and solved. Um, that, you know, as we saw in the previous slide, say, well, what can you get if you engage in this crime, right? Um, I mean, cl clearly, if you're um, burglarizing a home or robbing somebody, you could get something of financial gain, right? Um, but that the, you could have social profits as well, uh, that you could basically say uh, that, uh, hey, uh, that there are, uh, you know, some uh, killing somebody, uh, could, could it, I could profit from sort of a sense of revenge or a sense of increased status. Uh, you might say, what are the range of punishments if, if caught? Uh, if, and uh, that, it, you know, if you feel like the punishment isn't that great, you might engage in it. So there are a wide range of crimes that are considered rational. Um, you know, some seem like obviously rational, like white collar crime, right? So you're sitting, you know, and you're, you work for a corporation and then you want to def defraud investors or something like that, right? I mean, obviously you're, that's a rational act. It doesn't, it's not based on passion or irrationality. Uh, uh, you know, organized crime too, the, the ma mafia um, could also be seen as uh, organized. Uh, but, you know, your textbook talks about how regular street crimes, so-called street crimes, are also rational. Uh, that when you, like, look at crime trends, that, you know, crimes gen generally take place, um, particularly like uh, burglaries or, or theft uh, of home items, you know, those take place uh, when people are out of the house, right? Uh, that uh, when it comes to um, that you're more likely to have crimes in uh, summer months, right? Because people are out and about and they're not locked in their house. And also when they're not home, the windows could be open, right? Uh, homes that are on cul-de-sacs, much more likely to be um, robbed than other homes. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that you, you basically see that, uh, that, that, that street crimes, that there's some indication of rational action as well. And from this perspective that, you know, they, that this, the, uh, the, the choice theory uh, you know, says that, look, you know, some choose to commit crimes while others don't c choose it, even when dealing with factors that could impact one's ability to be rational, right? So there are a lot of people who suffer from a uh, drug addiction, uh, but the vast majority of people who suffer from drug addiction don't engage in criminal behavior. There's a lot of people who suffer from mental illness or from poverty or from poor parenting, right? Uh, but the vast majority of those people do not engage in crime. And so even if you are faced with these factors that are beyond your control from this perspective, that unless you're completely and utterly impaired in terms of rationality, uh, that you can, that even those that are confronted with mental illness or drug addiction, that they're still able to engage in a cost benefit analysis. And that's why they think it's the best theory to explain criminal behavior. So if crime is a rational act, what's the best approach to preventing crime? Well, you increase the costs associated with crime, you decrease the benefits of the crime, uh, the profits that one might get from it, the, those variety of profits. And so how do you go about achieving this goal? How do you go about um, you know, increasing costs and decreasing benefits in order to reduce crime commission? Okay, so according to Troy's theory, if crime is rational, then the prevention of crime should be rational as well. In other words, if criminals engage in a cost-benefit analysis, then the, um, the laws, the public policies, and the practices that we engage to reduce crime should also focus on increasing the costs, decreasing the benefits or rewards of crime commission. And so to understand that, there are three um, concepts that we need to talk about to understand this approach to preventing crime. Uh, the first is general deterrence. The second concept is specific deterrence. And the third concept is situational crime prevention. And so when looking at these first two, it's important that we define what we mean by the word deterrence, okay? And you see the definition right there. That deterrence is discouraging an action through instilling a fear, okay? And so, um, you know, I mean, quite frankly, that, um, you know, that uh, you take your quizzes on, uh, for this class, hopefully, right? Um, because you, the, the fear is, is that, oh, the quiz is going to close and I'm going to get 
a, a zero, right? And so there's a cost to not taking the quiz. And so that I'm, I'm trying to deter you from skipping quizzes by saying, hey, it's gonna close and you're not gonna get any points. That's deterrence. Um, another example of deterrence is like nuclear arms, right? That one country wants to invade another country, right? Um, but one, uh, but the, but both countries, you know, have nuclear weapons, right? Well, if one country begins to use nuclear weapons on another one, that 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 country will launch nuclear weapons against them basically having mass destruction. So countries are deterred in theory from taking uh, you know, aggressive stances against other countries because um, they fear nuclear annihilation, okay? And so here that this is sort of similar um, in terms of trying to um, discourage people from engaging in crimes. General deterrence is basically the, it's general because we're trying to send a men message to the general population, okay? And so remember James Q. Wilson, that mo most of us are just sitting around waiting to see how um, we respond to crime. And so that if that we really fear the punishment, like if I get caught, then I'm going to get a really stiff punishment. And that punishment, I'm scared of that punishment. I don't want to go to jail or prison for three years, right? And so that's sending a message to those who have yet to commit a crime. Uh, likewise, the fear of apprehension. Like, I'm thinking about committing a crime, but you know what? I hear the clearance rate on burglary is 90%, right? Not, the, not That's not a fact, right? But then you'd be really scared. You'd, and you'd say, you know what? I fear apprehension, so therefore I am not going to... Um, engage in that. And so general deterrence is a message is, that is being sent to those who have yet to commit a crime so that we can deter them from taking that action. Specific deterrence is focused on those who have already committed a crime, okay? And so basically it's, it's like you've committed a crime and you are getting a really harsh punishment, right? You're experiencing the pain of that. And so that when you get released, you're gonna remember that and then it's going to discourage you from reoffending. Um, also, fear of future apprehension. You got caught this time, you, you're likely to get caught again. And so when you got released, then you that it, it, it deters you from reoffending. okay? So that's the difference between general and specific. And that's why from this perspective that um, the, the choice theory would support truth in sentencing, long sentences, lots of police in order to deter, um, you know, to, uh, ap uh, to encourage apprehension and clearance of crime. Um, there's also what's known as situational crime prevention. And in that, that um, you make it harder for people to engage in crime. Um, and so target hardening, right? I live in River West. We kind of target harden our, um, our, our, our property, right? Because we know that little things can make a difference. So for example, we have a gate around our house and we always lock our gate, right? Um, that we have like a bicycle lock around it. And that makes it more difficult, not impossible, but if you're choosing between my house and my neighbor's house that doesn't have a gate or doesn't lock their gate, um, it's just making it more difficult to, um, you need more effort. You need to jump over my gate. You're more likely to get caught, right? So that's a good example of that target hardening. On the flip side of that, you can reduce rewards, right? Um, and so that, uh, that you know, uh, cell phones can, you know, when you steal a cell phone, you can wipe the data, right? And um, it, it becomes, you can even blow up the intern, in, you know, make it so that it's not usable, uh, therefore reducing the re uh, 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 rewards. You can have, you know, electronic scanners on it so that if you go and you steal something and then you try to pawn it, right, that you can be like, oh no, this is a stolen item, right? So you're reducing the rewards. So all of those are examples of the kinds of rational crime prevention that's put in place in order to increase um, uh, uh, the, the, in, and instill fear and in, in order to de deter action, criminal action. So are crimes rational acts? Maybe they are, but maybe they're not. Um, many crimes are committed while under the influence of drugs and alcohol when rational thought is impaired. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, about 40% of violent crimes are committed um, while the individual is e using drugs or and alcohol. Alcohol is probably the biggest um, uh, intoxicant. Intoxicant. So, right, I mean, as we know, when you are intoxicated, you're not thinking clearly, you're not being rational, you're not doing a cost-benefit analysis, at least as well as you otherwise could, and you could also be much more moved by passion rather than reason. Uh, we also know that um, many people uh, re-offend 
And so uh, that's what's known as re re uh, recidivism. Um, that the majority of prison inmates reoffend after they are released. So according to the Harvard Political Re Review, um, that within three years of the uh, of, of an individual's release, uh, fifty percent of those people are incarcerated again, and that's in light of you know a, kind of an increase in harsh punishments, right? And so that even at a time when we have harsher sentences, we still have a high reoffending rate, which basically means that uh, you're serving a significant uh, sentence yet you still reoffend, right? So uh, that seems to you know call into question the rational choice theory. Uh, and even the harshest punishments don't reduce crime. There is no clear link between the use of the death penalty and basically general deterrence, right? There's no clear link between the use of the death penalty and reductions in the homicide rates, right? Um, so that means that even knowing that you could get, uh, uh, could be put to death doesn't, you know, prevent you from engaging in a homicide. And there doesn't seem to be any clear link with the sex offender registries, right? So it would think you would think that if your name appears on a sex offender registry, you wouldn't like offend again. But there, there is no concrete evidence that um, being on the sex offender registry has any impact on whether or not you're going to um, re-offend and commit another sex offense. Okay, so maybe criminal acts are not entirely the product of free will. Maybe that there are some uh, actions and behaviors that we engage in. Uh, maybe that there are some actions and behaviors that we engage in that we don't really have a lot of control over. This idea, the kind of thinking critically about this idea of free, free choice, free will, um, that's going to be explored in this really interesting article you're going to be reading for your online discussion this week um, by the author David Engelman. And the name of the article is The Brain on Twi Trial, and it really questions the notion of free will. You know, basically, he argues that we think that we are that that we're the ones that are making all of these free choices, but that it's not as true as we think that it is that brain biology, brain chemistry, and genes play a significant role in the choices that we make. And so you're gonna see in the article, he talks about the role that, you know, having a brain tumor or uh, having a neurotransmitter chemical imbalances that are brought about either just by your own brain chemistry or by the, the taking of, uh, of drugs, uh, sleepwalking, you know, all of these sorts of um, activities that we are not freely choosing to engage in or that we can't and stop from engaging in them. And so this will give us a good opportunity to sort of do a critical think about the choice theory and, um, you know, learn more about what brain science says about free will. So the article Brain on Trial that you're going to be reading dovetails really nicely into the trait theory of criminal um, behavior. Uh, and trait theory is basically arguing that the reason that criminals, are, uh, the reason why people engage in criminal actions is because they are physically different. And so those uh, folks who are interested in studying sort of the biological aspects of crime um, that they're known as biocriminologists. And they basically attempt to link the physical traits or the physical conditions of humans with antisocial and criminal behavior. And the, the, what they look at involves three broad areas. And let's just put all three of these areas up at, one, at, at the same time, and then we'll, we'll walk through them. Uh, one thing they look at is biochemical factors, okay? That they basically say that crime is a function of a chemical imbalance in one's, um, in one's bodies. Uh, and so, you know, that could be uh, the environmental contaminants such as lead, that we know that if you, um, you know, consume uh, a lead, that it has an impact on your uh, brain development, in particular impulse control. Um, that hypoglycemia, low blood sugar can be uh, linked to um, uh, drug abuse that, you know, that people have, have lower blood sugars are more likely to be involved in drug abuse. And therefore, you, because of that biochemical factor, then you're more likely to use and be irrational in your actions. Hormones, uh, biochemical, you know, uh, that, uh, that, he'll, that Eagleman will talk about this. The more hormones you have, the more likely you are to engage in aggressive acts. Uh, there's also neurological pro problems uh, that criminals often 
uh, suffer from some sort of brain impairment. Now in the article that, that you're going to see like really, you know, big examples of brain impairment, such as brain tumors, right? Uh, but it also talks about neurotransmitters, right? The chemical that is, uh, or the, the, the part of your brain that kind of transfers chemicals in order to, you know, engage in certain, you know, uh, actions for your brain to take certain actions. And so uh, that when you think about uh, 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 neurotransmitters, you might be thinking about a serotonin uptake. Uh, it, it, how is serotonin being uptaked into your brain? Uh, it, not having a lot of in uptake or having too much can really impair um, the way your brain functions and the actions that follow out of that. And even genetic uh, influences, right? Uh, that there are some studies that look at the uh, that some that it seems as if maybe some delinquent tra traits are are inherited. Uh, that the criminality of parents uh, can have the ability to predict uh, the, de the, the de delinquency, the likely that their children will be criminals. Uh, and they also do twin studies where your DNA is the, the same um, and that, but you're raised in sort of different environments, like twins, identical twins who are separated in birth and see if they like sort of something about their DNA or their chemical makeup, their biological makeup, that it's something that is just embedded in that, them, uh, that it's a trait that they have regardless of the conditions that they're raised. Uh, so, so these are some of the things that the trait theory takes a look at and it's an interesting aspect of understanding crime. All right, so in this uh, lecture, we talked about choice theory and trait theory. In the next lecture, we're going to be talking about the social, sociological theories, um, social structure and social processing. Thank you for paying attention, and I'll talk to you again soon.